Well, let me welcome you to uh, our special lecture this evening. I'm Jim Edmondson. I am Chief Curator of the Dittrich Medical History Center. And as you may or may not know, several years ago, we had a gallery opening of a history of contraception gallery, and we were a bit at sea wondering, well, what next? And we decided amongst ourselves that the logical step was look, to look at the flip side of that coin, the history of childbirth. So we began on that project in a couple of different phases, and we're now coming to the conclusion of that. And as we depart here and go up to the reception, you'll get an opportunity to see that completed display uh, and also get to speak to the curator of that, uh, Catherine Osborne, who's with us in the audience. Uh, Catherine did the lion's share of the research and design of that exhibit, and we're very pleased with the outcome. Um, and it seemed only appropriate to have a speaker come and, and, and enlighten us on some aspect of childbirth, and uh, a, a logical choice was Jackie Wolf. Jackie is from not too far away. She teaches down at OU, where she's professor in the Department of Social Medicine. And she is a historian of medicine, having first written a book on breastfeeding, and then a book on anesthesia, Deliver Me From Pain, Deliver Me, a book on anesthesia and childbirth. And so I asked her to come and speak on that topic this evening. And I won't say any more except that uh, if you wait long enough, she will be your host at the American Association for the History of Medicine meeting, which she has kindly agreed to host at uh, really OU, but that people in Athens will be sharing the responsibilities for that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm chair of the annual meeting committee of the association, so I'm very pleased that this has happened. And I'm especially pleased for Jack to be able to join us tonight. Well, thanks so much, Jim, and I'm so honored to be here. I'm honored to be invited. Um, and Jim just told me, that I'll, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if people just use the mic, because all this is being recorded. So um, come to the front if you have questions later. I thought I would start this talk just by telling you how I got interested in this topic. Um, and as Jim mentioned, I, my first book was A History of Breastfeeding Practices in the US. And I found really quickly that it was really easy to find uh, physicians' views of, of infant feeding, um, especially in the 19th century when so many babies were dying of diarrhea. So doctors were, you know, they, they, were, writing in, they were writing autobiographies, they had personal papers, they were writing at length in medical journals, there were all kinds of baby-saving organizations. It was very easy to see the medical side. Um, I was less certain about how to find women's views and women's stories about how they actually fed their babies and the decisions they made. And being a graduate student, because that, that was my dissertation topic, you're always worried about time, you're worried about expense. I wasn't sure I'd be able to find something as mundane as infant feeding and women's accounts of it in, um, in their personal papers, in their letters, in their diaries. Um, but I took a risk. And I, uh, I went around to archives that have really rich collections, not, a, not a, of business papers, but of um, women's personal papers who lived far from families, writing to sisters, writing to mothers, women who kept diaries. And sure enough, um, it was a eureka moment. Lots of rich thoughts of women as they struggled to care for babies. And the, the way I got into history of birth is, obviously, birth comes just before infant feeding. Um, so I was so fascinated by the birth stories. And it wasn't like women didn't write about pregnancies. That was very private. Even in their own diaries, they didn't mention a pregnancy. And suddenly, there'd be a phrase, I was confined with a sickness, and then a baby would appear in their lives. So I began, as I looked through women's letters and diaries, I actually scanned for the word sickness, not in reference to a baby, but in reference to the woman who was doing the writing. And sure enough, without fail, it would be about a birth. And then the baby would appear. I began to carefully, even though women didn't talk about their pregnancies, they did write about their births. And I began to take very, very careful notes about what women said about their birth experience. By the time I was teaching at Ohio University, which was in, in 1998, was when I started there, I was teaching medical students, I was teaching undergrads, and I was teaching graduate students. And one of the classes I offered through the history department was uh, history of women's health and medicine in US history. And of course, for women's history of women's health, any, all aspects of reproduction are at the center of that story. So I was really excited to teach young women about the history of childbirth practices, which, as you'll soon find, is a really fascinating, uh, fascinating topic. So as I'm talking to these students about childbirth, I felt like in order for them to understand doctors' treatments and women's decisions about how they would be treat treated, they had to learn a little bit about the physiology of childbirth. 
So I would begin to talk about the history of childbirth by explaining basic childbirth physiology. And what I wasn't, what I didn't expect was that here I was up there, I was so excited, and I was so excited to describe this, because usually it was mainly women who would, who would take my women's health history class, um, although a couple of men did. Um, but it would be mainly a sea of female faces out there. And here I am all excited explaining the physiology of childbirth, and what was being reflected back at me was absolute horror and fear and terror. And I actually had one young woman in one of the early classes who verbalized it for everyone. She raised her hand and she said to me, I want my epidural in the hospital parking lot. That's what she said. And Suddenly I had my research question, because for me, I was, um, I came of age during the heyday of natural childbirth. So what I wondered was, how did two back-to-back -back generations go from treating childbirth as though it was a symbol of women's strength and empowerment and control to a mere 20 years later? So going from the 1970s to the 1990s, suddenly you have a whole generation of women who want to obliterate every sensation of childbirth and get the epidural in the hospital parking lot. What happened? What, what was the change? Of, what caused that incredible change of attitude? Um, so that, what, that became my central research question, to use all those notes that I had set aside about birth, not quite knowing what I was going to do with it. Um, there was something else that I had, had observed as I was keeping those notes. So now you know what my research question was from the women's end. I want to tell you a little bit about what I noticed about how doctors were using obstetric anesthesia. For a long time, roughly from the mid-19th century, and uh, ether and chloroform were discovered back to back in 1846, first used in uh, childbirth in 1847, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But one thing I noticed that was so unusual was the way doctors used obstetric anesthesia from roughly the mid-19th century pretty much through the 1950s. So we're talking about a little over a century. OK, so I've got to give you my brief physiology of childbirth uh, spiel before I, before, so you understand how unusual it was the way doctors were using it. I mean, a lot of you might know this, but it's worth going over. Uh, labor is in two phases. Um, in the first stage labor, the cervix is very slowly opening up and thinning out and pulling back. Um, the medical terminology is dilation and effacement. Dilation referring to the opening up of the cervix, effacement referring to the thinning of the cervix. So that's what first stage labor is all about. That's the painful part of labor. However, first stage labor is divided into two phases. The first phase um, actually is not painful at all. It's when the, when the cervix is very slowly opening over many, many hours, sometimes many days. A lot of women don't feel it at all or get kind of a, a slight backache. Some women feel a twinge as though they were getting slight menstrual cramps. Um, but it's very easily tolerated, the first half of, of first stage labor. And then women get into what's called the active phase. And that's when the cervix starts opening up more rapidly. And that's the phase that most women refer to as painful. Um, and yet it builds very, very slowly. Um, it's not like someone is suddenly in excruciating pain. You ha always have a respite, you know, several minutes between each contraction. And the contractions in the, in the second part of first stage labor get closer together and harder to weather. And a lot of midwives who, who um, will tell you that they often will, um, if someone is calling and saying, I'm ready to give birth, they, they will actually ask a woman to talk through a contraction because that signals to, to someone who really understands um, the physiology of labor, it gets really hard to talk through a contraction during the active phase, the second part of first stage labor. The very, very most painful part is called transition. It's called transition because it's the, it's the stage where you're moving from first stage labor with the cervix opening up and the second stage of labor. Um, and the second stage of labor is very, very different from the first stage. It's, um, the cervix is then open 10 centimeters, fully open, and the baby is ready to enter the birth canal. So again, the painful part is the cervix very slowly over many, many hours, sometimes days, slowly opening up. Transition 
is the really hardest part to weather. It happens very rapidly. The last 20 minutes of first stage labor, 10 to 20 minutes, where the, uh, the cervix opens from 8 centimeters to 10 centimeters, fully dilated. Um, and women who have gone, women who go through labor consistently in everything I looked at in, in a hundred year period, over a hundred years, women who went through it without any pain relief always describe transition. Uh, the very end of first stage labor is the hard part. Okay, now you have the fully open cervix, you're done with first stage labor. And then the uterus, which is, a, which is really a giant muscle, and can exert up to 50 pounds of pressure, suddenly begins acting like a piston to push the baby out of the uterus and into the birth canal. This is the part of labor that women, let me, just, let me uh, quote, quote women. Um, women describe it, no pain at all, only very hard work. Another woman, joyful, not painful. Someone else, it actually feels good to push. Another woman refers to it as the fun part. However, for, wit sorry, for witnesses, the second stage of labor looks horrific. Because as your uterus is acting, as this giant muscle is actually pushing, exerting 50 pounds of pressure, women's faces involuntarily get very contorted. They make all kinds of funny noises because you have this, imagine this thing pushing inside. Um, your face gets distorted. It can be very disturbing for witnesses to look at. Um, midwives call this stage of labor animaling out because women actually, they're making animal-like sounds. Most people don't realize it's totally involuntarily involuntary. It's not because they're in pain. Uh, Barbara Katz Rothman, the medical sociologist, she, she, her, she has the best explanation I've ever read. Uh, in, in one of her books, she explains why witnesses misunderstand that experience of second stage labor. Um, she describes her um, first birth um, and says of second stage labor, quote, it was the strangest and in some ways the nicest sensation I've ever had. Um, yet she also says that she involuntarily, the, the pushing, uh, her involuntary, um, the, uh, the, um, the involuntary pushing that she had with the force of her uterus caused, again these are her, her words, she said, I heard noises coming out of my throat that I couldn't believe, like the soundtrack of a horror movie. So, what doctors were witnessing, and, I, and this whole explanation is, is culminating in this, the way doctors were using anesthesia for much of the history I'm going to be talking about, women went all through first stage labor, including transition, the hardest part of labor, only to find that when their uterus started, started acting like a piston and they started making these funny noises and contorting their face and getting red in the face, doctors thought, oh my goodness, this looks like this woman is about to die. I bet her, I better give her general anesthesia. So women, if you ask anyone, especially from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, they'll all tell you the same story. I wasn't awake for my, for my baby's uh, birth. I was given ether, I was put out, I was unconscious. So women went through the hardest part of labor only as the baby's head crowned would they be put under general anesthesia because doctors thought that was the most painful part. It's a classic example of the treatment being dictated by the witness, who in this case was the physician, as opposed to the woman who was having the experience. So that too made me incredibly interested when I realized how Dr. T had used obstetric anesthesia in addition to the way young women were reacting to childbirth. I was also fascinated by the way doctors had used obstetric anesthesia and misinterpreted the experience that women were having. Um, so there, again, there was my next book, A History of Changing Views of Labor Pain. Um, and what I found, my main conclusion, um, was that it wasn't primarily medical innovation that changed the very different ways people viewed labor pain and the way um, obstetric anesthesia was used over time. It was really cultural and social phenomenon. And that's what I'm going to spend roughly the next half hour talking about, telling you that entire story from 1847 right up to the present day. So the first woman, we actually know who the very first woman was in the U.S. who used obstetric anesthesia. Um, Fanny Appleton Longfellow in 1847. She lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
She was married to the Harvard professor and poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and she was pregnant with her third child. And she made this decision that she wanted to have ether. Again, ether and chloroform had been available for only a year and were used in surgical, uh, surgical suites. But um, she was the first one in the United States to, to think about using ether um, during childbirth. Um, the decision, it was not a last minute decision. She sent Henry out to try to find an amenable doctor and he went from doctor to doctor. Everyone said to him it was dangerous, it was crazy. They all advised him not to use it. But he was persistent <clears throat> and he ultimately found Nathan Cooley Keep. Uh, Keep was a Boston physician who specialized in dentistry, and he'd used ether on his dental patients. He was one of the few doctors in uh, Boston at the time who was not afraid of, of um, ether, and um, he agreed to attend the birth. Um, other doctors, on the other hand, had said, for something as trivial as childbirth, you're crazy to use this potentially dangerous gas. Now, we know about this medical adventure because Keep actually wrote about it. And he, his article was published in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. Um, he wrote that the birth went incredibly well. And Fanny, too, we know from her family letters, she was just as pleased. In letters to families and friends, she declared her third birth to be much better than her two earlier ones. She reported that under the influence of ether, she'd never felt better or labored more comfortably. She pronounced, now these words are really important. She declared ether, these are Fanny's words, certainly the great, greatest blessing of this age. And she declared herself proud to be the pioneer to less suffering for poor, weak womankind. Now what's really interesting, despite all this celebration, Nathan, Dr. Keep is celebrating, the, the Longfellows are celebrating, it, it's never really made clear why they sought this treatment that every doctor they approached said was unsafe. Fanny's first two births offer us absolutely no clues. Both Henry and Fanny report those births were pretty easy. Those, those are their words. Um, what I think happened was that Fanny's pride in her ability to offer hope to so-called poor, weak womankind offers us a clue as to why Henry went out to search for a doctor who was willing to give his wife ether. Historians have described the middle and upper class women of this era as fashionably sick. That's the judgment of historians who have looked at this era. Frailty and lethargy were a desirable part of female identity. That's what made you attractive. In this context, obstetric anesthesia was, a, was a, a solution to two social problems. What seemed to be the inherent sickliness of especially upper class and middle class white women and the nation's plummeting fertility rate, especially again among that same demographic, upper and middle class white women. Between 1800 and 1900, the fertility rate, rate of white women of childbearing age was cut in half. Um, from 7.04 children on average per woman of childbearing age to 3.56 children. Doctors believed, I mean we know now, women, women historians who have looked at this know now it was really, this was really about negotiation and cooperation among, among uh, partners, um, deciding the size of their families. But at the time, doctors believed that weak women were choosing not to, not to give birth because it was so horrifically painful. And they assumed that, e that ether would, in their words, rob childbirth of its chief terror, meaning unbearable pain. Um, and they thought that that would encourage, the use of ether would encourage culturally desirable women to have larger families. Um, this was a time of anti-immigrant sentiment, not so much unlike today, and the hope was that obstetric anesthesia would ensure that the country would not be overrun with immigrants who tended to have um, larger families. In another era, obstetric anesthesia might not even have caught on, or at least caught on that early, but in the age of number one, the fashionably sick woman, two native-born white women deciding to have smaller families, and a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment and the fear that immigrants would soon be outnumbering native-born Americans, obstetric anesthesia found an eager audience. Um, one, of the th one of the threads you're going to find as I tell you this story from generation to generation is that anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia, was really a highly political tool. Um, 
the administration of anesthesia was actually portrayed accordingly. It was, it was portrayed in obstetric textbooks appealing to a specific class of woman, to appeal to the right woman, as a genteel process that was tailor-made for delicate women. Um, here we have um, an allegedly typical woman inhaling chloroform during labor. And you can see she's in labor, but look how she's dressed. So clearly the message is this is the kind of woman who would benefit from this treatment. But it was also a really dangerously haphazard process. This is the reality of the way it was used. Doctors would simply sprinkle liquid ether on a handkerchief. There was no protocol, there was no measurements on a handkerchief, hold it over a woman's nose and mouth. And depending, I mean, every doctor had a different theory of when a woman had enough. Some doctors would say as soon as the woman's uh, uh, arm fell off the edge of the bed, I would know that she'd had enough and then he wouldn't give her any more until she stirred again. Um, but again, it was very, very haphazard. Um, and, it's, and some women had overdoses, and, and uh, a few women died. And as the years went on, actually, it became more dangerous, and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that in a little while. But um, there were deaths due to using general anesthesia in childbirth and women being overdosed or, or vomiting and then you know, aspirating their vomit. Um, and it's very ironic that a medical treatment that, that really did pose serious risks to mothers and babies throughout much of this history actually diminished women's and physicians' anxieties about birth. It's one of the many ironies of treatment, uh, medical treatment during childbirth in, in U.S. history. The next phase of obstetric anesthesia began in 1914 with something called twilight sleep. That was the next big innovation in obstetric anesthesia. Um, twilight sleep was a mix of scopolamine, which isn't even a painkiller at all. It's an amnesiac. And um, when you're under the influence of scopolamine, you have no memory of the experience at all. So twilight sleep was, was a mix of scopolamine and morphine, which is an opiate. And women's magazines actually took up the twilight sleep cause. They uh, widely publicized the benefits of twilight sleep. And this spurred a very militant nationwide uh, movement for to, making twilight sleep available to all women, largely because this was an era of enormous women's activism. Um, uh, women's groups fought for all kinds of causes in the early 20th century. Um, world peace, access to contraception, temperance, women's suffrage, uh, lowered infant mortality, and that doesn't even get into all of it. This, this is the era that is now labeled the progressive era. Uh, from roughly 18, the 1890s to World War I, they were part of a flurry of reform that was uh, aimed at trying to mitigate all the problems caused by rapid urbanization and industrialization in the US. And the thought was twilight sleep was considered part of that movement, uh, mainly because there was a theory that the urban environment was so artificial that the women who lived in big cities were like hothouse plants, that was, that was the word that was used, that were weakened by this artificial environment. Um, and again, the, some of the same arguments we heard er, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, that women were weakened by this artificial environment and therefore twilight sleep became part of the flurry of reform because it too was gonna cure something caused by rapid urbanization. That, that, that's how twilight sleep got swept up into the progressive era movements. Um, however, despite there were similar, similar rationales for, for ether and chloroform in the 19th century and twilight sleep in the early part of the 20th century, um, but the effects of twilight sleep were portrayed very differently than the effects of ether. Um, and that's because times had changed and the, the view of the ideal woman had changed a lot. Um, during the era of twilight sleep, it was the bicycle riding Gibson girl um, that was considered the desirable, the strong modern day woman. So twilight sleep was portrayed, one of the ways it was sold to women is that rather than being drugged and not being able, not being able to be conscious or care for your baby right away, you'd be able to sit up in bed um, that's as soon as your baby was born. Now this woman doesn't look very energetic to me, but 
it's an interesting photograph because she was portrayed that way, which is simply, to me, a contrast with what women were, were like previously under the influence of general anesthesia. Because um, this woman is this photograph, this is you know almost immediately after the birth. Um, and due to the there was also a big crusade, again, part of the progressive era, to lower infant mortality. So women's magazines began to carry photographs, not just of mothers able to sit up right after giving birth, but of the robust babies who were the products of twilight sleep. Um, here we have children who were born under Dammerschlaf. Dammer the twilight sleep came from the German word, li literal translation, Dammerschlaf, which literally means twilight sleep. Um, Twilight Sleep was perfected in, in Freiburg, Germany, and a lot of really wealthy American women actually went to Freiburg just to give birth. And they were the ones who came back, they wrote about their experience in Freiburg, they're the ones who started the Twilight Sleep movement in the US. So all Americans knew Dammerschlaf. They knew what Dammerschlaf meant. Um, here's another photo from another woman's magazine. This one was labeled Excellent Specimen of a Dammerschlaf Baby. And literally, the chubby cheeks were attributed Twilight Sleep got all the credit for those chubby cheeks. Um, here we have four Dahmerschlaf children, just the twinkle in their eyes. Everything was credited to Twilight Sleep. Uh, this next photo is really my favorite. It's, it's fuzzy, but let, let me describe it for you. Um, this picture's caption inform readers that the six-year-old boy who's on our right, his, his mother's left, um, and you can't see it because the, the reproduction is so bad, but he's kind of frowning. Um, he was born the old school way, which, which that's kind of caused his grumpiness is the implication. Um, the four-year-old girl, who's two years younger than her brother and already slightly taller, uh, the caption says she's, quote, rapidly outdistancing her older brother in physical development because she was born under twilight sleep. Um, and the message was, was, was absolutely clear. Twilight sleep not only provided mothers with painless birth and postpartum energy in an era when everyone was newly aware that infant, infant death was really largely preventable, which really wasn't understood in the middle of the 19th century. It was kind of considered babies are born weak, they're susceptible, it's, it's normal that they die in high numbers. But by the early 20th century, it was really, the message was getting out, it was largely preventable. So, um, part, of part of the message of Twilight Sleep was that it would guarantee faster growing, better babies if you, if you gave birth under Twilight Sleep. Um, but while the uh, public image of strength and energy became the popular image of Twilight Sleep, the realities were really quite different. Um, scopolamine, and remember it's an amnesiac, has nothing to do with, with pain relief, but again, you don't remember the experience when you're under its influence. Um, it actually, we know now, it actually intensified labor pain. It made women so delirious that there were reports of women running, screaming through hospital corridors. There were even reports of women attempting to um, walk out onto fire escapes and jump off of, of a building because they become so delirious under its influence. So what happened was, um, let's see. doctors began to build canvas cages to enclose women when they were under the influence of twilight sleep, they would then labor in these canvas cages and stay safe in there. Some hospitals even made straitjackets, which is, which is the photographs you see on, on, your, on your right, um, so that women could safely labor under the influence of twilight sleep and not hurt themselves. And the covering over the woman's eyes was very deliberate too because the thought was that she was so agitated under twilight sleep that, that the thought was that if you could just dull all of her senses. They would put cotton in a woman's ears, they would cover her eyes, um, and the thought was then that they would be um, much safer. Women, however, denied any Ill, Ill effects from the use of twilight sleep. One typical mother treated with twilight sleep said, this is a quote, it makes no difference to me what the doctors say about forgetfulness. For me, it was painless. Um, and twilight sleep, for many reasons, and, and 
obviously, uh, the photographs here you see are, are some of them. Uh, it didn't remain popular for long. And another reason was um, one of the biggest, uh, most public um, advocates for Twilight Sleep, Franc uh, Mrs. Frances Carmody. I've never been able to find her first name. Everyone was Mrs. and, and used their, their husband's name. Um, she died in childbirth, and that became very well known. It apparently had nothing to do with the Twilight Sleep, but that kind of made everyone back away from the, the morphine scopolamine mix. But Twilight Sleep did instigate one incredibly important permanent change in obstetric protocol. Before Twilight Sleep, only the most desperate women gave birth in hospitals. Uh, women who were widowed, women who were single and rejected by their families because they were pregnant. Um, Birth, home birth was the absolute norm, and only if you were absolutely desperate did you give birth in a hospital. But the exacting protocol required by Twilight Sleep necessitated and normalized hospital birth for the first time of women of all classes. It took about, um, it wasn't until the late 1930s that uh, roughly half of all births in the U.S. took place in the hospital. So it took some time, but Twilight Sleep was one of the major entrees into the hospital. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, about, again, this is about 15 years after the heyday of twilight sleep, um, by the time half of all births were taking place in the hospital, um, it was really interesting the way doctors were beginning to portray uh, childbirth. Because in the 19th century, doctors had kind of honored so-called, this, this is their terminology, primitive women for the way they were able to weather birth and, and frail urban women couldn't do it so well, but the primitive women were really strong. Um, uh, civilized mothers, as they put them. Civilized mothers, they would kind of be kind of mournful that civilized mothers need so much help to give birth. By the time, um, uh, by the 1930s, there was an opposite portrayal. Um, women now who were so-called primitive were being maligned. Um, here, here one doctor in his obstetric text he says, he talks about the quote, primitive mother squatting on her bed of leaves, suffering an animal-like silence. And then the positive contrast now was um, the contemporary American woman who gave birth, quote, in a dreamy, half-conscious state, awaking in smiles, a mother with no recollection of having become one. So it was, it, it was like, it was completely flipped over what was a good portrayal and what was uh, the bad portrayal. And women conjured similar, similar images. Women's, um, to quote some women, in a 1940 article in Harper's Magazine, one mother uh, ridiculed, these are her, her words, the uncivilized coarse pioneer who gave birth to a baby behind a bush on the Oregon Trail, like the squaw they always tell you about. She was grateful that the torment of birth had, quote, eased a lot since grandma's day, thanks to nembutol, gas, cyclopropane, and all the rest. And that's when you see um, obstetric journals. So we're talking about the 1940s now. Every other page in the medical journals that doctors read was an advertisement for a different kind of um, obstetric anesthesia. After World War II, the anxiety elicited by the Cold War encouraged similar support for obstetric anesthesia. Um, and again, Every time you read words, especially now when, you, when, when you're looking at women's magazines, and they would talk about birth, they would talk about anesthesia, it was always tied in with contemporary social and political events. So during the Cold War, in an era when Americans feared domestic as well as foreign threats, some physicians began to argue that obstetric anesthesia had the power to eradicate all kinds of dangers. Mothers who gave birth under the influence of anesthesia were, this is a quote, not mental and physical wrecks as the result of childbearing, and so they have the wherewithal to rear healthy and happy citizens, not communists, fascists, or Nazis. So again, here we have obstetric anesthesia, and it's being connected with the availability of antibiotics. In, this is, you know, we're in the post-war world now, after World War II. And the availability of antibiotics really marked a turning point, which me most contemporary Americans don't appreciate, in the way the public viewed physicians, the way they viewed medical treatment. 
One physician remembered, this is a quote from a doctor, that was a very heady experience for a doctor because while we were busy doing things for people all the time, we really weren't doing any curing. Then came the antibiotics and it seemed like we were curing everybody. Now this is pretty recent. I mean, I know for you young folks out there, it doesn't seem like World War II was, was just yesterday, but it really is, I mean, it really is true that, that um, you know, there were certain things that doctors could do and there were certain, certainly surgical procedures that they could do, but antibiotics were a really turning point in, in medical history. Um, and in this context, obstetricians began to administer not just that last minute general anesthesia, but they began to layer multiple drugs throughout labor. Um, only again, then, yes, then to give the general anesthesia on top of that in the delivery room. Um, and I'll describe some of those um, in, in, a, in a minute. I mean, it was, it was an extraordinary protocol. I mean, women were, um, uh, the, the layers of drugs can't be exaggerated. And as the number of drugs given to laboring women, again, after, after World War II, so we're talking about the 1950s and 1960s, um, as the number of drugs increased, one Philadelphia physician, very prominent, um, complained that obstetric treatment was becoming, in his words, primarily, again, he's referring now to obstetricians treating women during birth. He complained that obstetric treatment was becoming primarily, in his words, treatment of drug confusion. Um, and in this atmosphere, I mean, the amount of disorientation that women were feeling with barbiturates la labeled on, uh, layered on top of tranquilizers, and then comes the general anesthesia. This was a photograph in an obstetric text warning doctors about how disoriented women could get. This woman had flung herself off the bed and fell face first onto a metal radiator, chipped her tooth, and bruised her chin. This is during labor. Um, so a warning to doctors about how confused and disoriented women became. However, rather than backing up on the layering of, of drugs, doctors actually began to explore other drugs to mitigate the confusion caused by the barbiturates and, and opiates. Um, and one of the drugs they hit upon in the 1960s was the use of Thorazine during childbirth. Thorazine, a lot of you might have heard of it. Thor Thorazine is actually, it's a, it's a tranquilizer um, synthesized by a French pharmaceutical company. It's injected intramuscularly. And it produces such, again, this, these are, these are uh, quotes from, from um, uh, medical journal. It produces profound hypnotic sedative action that doctors described the laboring women who were given it as though as exhibiting, quote, a medical prefrontal lobotomy. Um, the drug proved so uniquely powerful that ult its ultimate use was um, on um, psychotic patients in mental hospitals. And Thorazine actually transformed inpatient psychiatric care. And it almost single-handedly converted the nation's gloomy, locked, and barred psychiatric wards into airy dormitories with screen doors and very tranquilized zombie-like patients. But it really was able to transform um, psychiatric facilities. But let me show you how it was portrayed at the time in obstetric journals. It was portrayed as good for mothers. Um, this uh, this ad particular ad, a quote from the ad says, it allays apprehension and agitation, it reduces suffering. So again, it, it's not a pain reliever, but it reduces agitation. So it was, again, it was another layer given to women who were given op opiates and barbiturates throughout labor. Not in the delivery room, but in the labor room. This is an era when now we have labor delivery and recovery rooms where you do it all in one room. Then you would labor either in a ward or in a room. When you, when you were in second stage, you were pushing. They would wheel you into a surgical suite where you would then deliver the baby. So the treatment would be different. You'd get the layers of drugs in the um, labor room, and then you get the general anesthesia or sometimes regional anesthesia, depending on the decade, um, in the surgical suite as you were delivering your baby. And women's implied suffering um, without medication is obvious in this drawing that accompanied the ad. Um, you know, the, the agonized bed rail clutching um, is not going to occur with drugs, or women at least will be calmed uh, with the use of Thorazine. It was also portrayed as being good for babies, too. Um, because uh, uh, this particular ad says, quote, it reduces the need for resuscitation in babies. 
because yes, <laughs> narcotized newborns were also uh, the norm in this era. Again, we're talking about the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s. The array of drugs given to women um, were so severe that babies were born with repressed be breathing. Um, and let me describe some of this protocol. Um, one common protocol was to give multiple injections of scopolamine and Demerol. Scopo so scopolamine was still being used, not to the extent it was with twilight sleep. Um, but it would be done in conjunction with Demerol, which is a narcotic, followed later, later by benzedrine, which is an amphetamine, to reverse the effects of the Demerol so that the baby's breathing wouldn't be too repressed, followed in the delivery room by ether or nitrous oxide or a regional anesthetic. Another common drug protocol included secanol, which is a barbiturate, and scopolamine, followed by Thorazine, again, used to quell the agitation and theoretically um, so the baby wouldn't be born so narcotized, um, followed later, la later again by ether or nitrous oxide or regional anest anesthesia in the delivery room. All these drug babies, this is actually the origins of the APGAR score. Any of you who have, have had children know what the APGAR score is. Um, all babies still today are immediately, when they're born, they're given a score at one minute and five minutes. It's uh, to judge whether or not the baby's in trouble. Do they need medical aid? Are they having trouble breathing? It looks at their color. It looks at their respiration effort. It looks at their muscle tone. It looks at, at five different things, the same five things that, that anesthesiologists use to make sure someone under general anesthesia um, doesn't need resuscitation. Um, the Apgar, uh, Virginia Apgar was an anesthesiologist. She um, spent a lot of time in labor and delivery, and she was the one who kept saying, because she had seen the sea change in, in babies. She was old enough to have seen a change in such babies were, didn't used to be born narcotized. Why are they being born now uh, narcotized? She theorized th that the drugs given to mothers during labor were affecting their babies. At the time, believe it or not, the thought was the placenta protected the baby, that the placenta acted like a bodyguard so that nothing dangerous could get through to the baby. We know now just the opposite is true, this, that it acts like a sieve, like a sponge. The baby gets first call on everything that the mother ingests. Um, but then it was thought it couldn't be that because the placenta is protecting the baby. Apgar was able to prove that the drugs the mothers were being given entered the umbilical vein within two minutes. She was the first doctor to be able to prove that. Um, but rather than, ba again, rather than back off of, on all the drugs, the Apgar score ended up being the solution at the time because then they would just quickly get the baby's score and know right away whether or not the baby needed help. That was needed then. Pediatricians were not um, normally in the delivery room in that era. In fact, babies didn't get a complete pediatric workup until 24 hours after birth. So the APGAR score was the first thing ever invented to make everyone pay attention to that newborn other than counting fingers and toes, that they would you know, actually assess the newborn and decide if the newborn needed medical aid. Um, despite all these dangers, the challenges posed by the baby boom actually, again, amplified the use of multiple drugs. It got even worse than what I, what I described. Most births during the baby boom were to first-time mothers, women who always have the longest labors and need the most attention. To compound the problem, many doctors were still serving in the armed forces, um, leaving fewer medical professionals to attend to all these first-time mothers. Um, and, mother, and, and women were having babies very rapidly then. It was very common to have every two years. Women, reproductive years in that era would, you know, you'd be done giving birth to all the kids you would have by about the age of 26, 27. Um, so people would, people would have their three or four or five children usually in their 20s very rapidly. Um, increasingly, drugs were substituted for the overworked physicians and nurses who had no time to sit with laboring women and comfort them and make them less fearful. Um, so physicians, they were very honest. They did not pretend. They, they confirmed that this is why they used all these drugs, to keep the labor room calm, quiet. Women didn't need so much attention. Um, they even jokingly referred. This is an ad for um, an opioid, Nizentil. Um, which was far more potent and faster acting than Demerol. They jokingly called Nizentil nice and still, 
um, and, be, and they absolutely acknowledge that that's why they use the drug. <laughs> okay, so we're getting into the birth reform era. There was a women, there was a, there was a definite backlash to all this treatment. The first indication of women's dissatisfaction with post-war obstetric practice appeared in May 1958 in a scathing article in the Ladies' Home Journal. Uh, published, the headline of the article was Journal Mothers Report on Cruelty in Maternity Wards. Um, a Detroit mother whose husband was a veterinarian, now these are all quotes from women, <clears throat> she observed, quote, even animal maternity cases are treated with a little more grace than is accorded human mothers. A Columbus, Ohio woman charged that nurses routinely lacked women for hours, quote, in lonely labor rooms, which was true, only to shuttle them off to delivery rooms among brusque, brusque strangers like sacks of potatoes from the A&P when they were ready to give birth. Um, women singled out in this article for, um, a spe for special condemnation, mandatory anesthesia. Again, quotes from women. They give you drugs whether you want them or not. Another mother complained, modern painkillers are used for the convenience of the doctor, not to spare the mother. Um, and that was, that was throughout this article. And then there was a follow-up article a few months later um, with even worse stories in it, especially focusing on obstetric anesthesia. Um, in 1964, this is another, another great uh, quote, because um, now we're getting into the civil rights era, we're getting into the Vietnam War era. Um, a 43-year-old man foreshadowed, and he had just, he had just um, observed his wife's, wife's birth. Um, he foreshadowed both the anti-war and natural childbirth movements when he complained in Harper's Magazine that obstetric anesthesia, I mean, essentially, he said it ruins the souls of entire nations. This is his quote. The drug gets into the baby, and the infant is born too doped to suckle. So the baby stays on the bottle, graduates to pasty canned foods, and grows up with its oral needs unsatisfied. And that is why so many people smoke too much, drink too much alcohol, and need tranquilizers and sleeping pills. This is also why we build hydrogen bombs instead of schools and hospitals for the poor. We're frustrated from birth, so we grow up filled with hostility and fear. So again, obstetric anesthesia, in, in this case, it's not doing a good, it's doing an evil. Like the observers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries who linked obstetric anesthesia with an array of social improvements, birth reform activists in the 1970s connected natural childbirth with societal betterment. As the women's movement and soon popular culture began to celebrate women's strength and creative ability, birth without anesthesia became a vehicle to demonstrate women's unique power. Now I want to show you this, I, I love this because Natural childbirth was actually int introduced in the 1940s, and the representation of women's magazines in the 1940s of, of natural childbirth is incredibly different than the way it was represented in the, in the 1970s. Because in that era, um, and they did, women's magazines did publicize natural childbirth in that era, and the author of one article in the 1940s about natural childbirth, he marveled that the woman he met who had just given birth an hour before, he wrote, quote, Every hair was in place. Powder and lipstick were on just so. So in the 1940s and 50s, um, other magazines also praised women's ability to, to keep that picture-perfect appearance during birth that was so prized in that era. Um, and let me show you some of the photographs. This is from a Look magazine photo es essay about natural childbirth in the 1940s. And please note, this is all black and white, but you can tell this woman has red lipstick on. I mean, she is fully made up while she's in labor. Um, here the caption reads, an inner calm replaces pain. Hesitant pride and joy mark the face of the mother immediately after delivery. Here we have a moment of poignant wonder. During labor, she conversed calmly with physicians. And here, fully aware at her great moment. Um, and here, this is, this is from a medical journal trying to sell doctors on natural childbirth. And here we have another woman. Note, she has red lipstick on, her red uh, nail polish on. Um, and again, the, the picture, 
picture perfect appearance. She is not drugged, she is not vomiting, she is not delirious, and she's fully made up and her hair is, in, is perfect. 30 years later, women's magazines use equally approving terms to describe mothers immediately after a natural birth, but this time <clears throat> they were ideal 1970s women. They were panting and they were pushing and they were sweating. They were orgasmic, their hair was askew, and their man was by their side. The representation of obstetric anesthesia, or in this case, the lack thereof, continued to be allied with broad social concerns and the ever-changing depiction of the ideal woman. And in this year, again, the, the whole narrative flipped. While mothers had once compared their agonizing unmedicated births with their heavenly anesthetized births, now women were doing the opposite. They contrasted their dizzy, nauseating, barely remembered, drugged births with their subsequent thrilling, invigorating, empowering, fully felt, natural births. Our Bodies Ourselves, um, which first came out in the early 1970s, the, the, and it still comes out periodically, the Feminist Health Manifesto, written by the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, reassured women that, quote, giving birth does not have to be lonely and frightening. We can prepare ourselves. And that became um, kind of the, the mantra of the women's health reform movement. We can prepare ourselves for everything, not just for childbirth, but for breastfeeding, for, con for contraception, for, for physical exams, we can educate ourselves. Um, women began to question even the most well-accepted aspects of birth practice in the U.S., inciting the significantly lower maternal and infant, infant mortality rates in Western European countries, which still to this day have significantly lower maternal and infant mortality rates than we have here. Um, our bodies ourselves was, was challenging the bedrock of American obstetric care, that is doctor-attended hospitalized birth. Because in Western European countries, midwife-attended birth was the norm, and still to this day, home birth um, is a norm in many Western European countries. As the women's movement and soon popular culture began to celebrate the strength and creative ability of women, birth without anesthesia became a vehicle to demonstrate women's power. And in accordance with the budding environmental movement, feminist activists and women's health reform also argued that natural childbirth made labor safer because it kept that, you know, the, the, all those drugs away from the baby, away from the mother, um, and it, it saved them from dangerous drugs and medical procedures. However, <laughs> within a decade and a half, and this, this is what fascinated me about my, my students mirroring terror and horror as I talked about the physiology of labor, um, within a decade and a half of the heyday of the birth reform movement, natural childbirth became an object of ridicule. Birth without medication was no longer invigorating and transforming, in fact, it was crazy. As one women's uh, magazine advised, here are some quotes, birth is not an extreme sport. This is from the 1990s. Um, I, I was struck by an episode of ER um, showing a nurse, um, one of the main characters, Carol, on the show, being, uh, she was pregnant with twins. She was being wheeled up to delivery with another nurse yelling after her, don't be a hero, get the epidural. As a columnist for the Boston Herald noted in 1999, more and more women are deciding there is nothing noble about writhing one's way through labor and delivery. Indeed, the most orgiastic moment of the day is more likely simultaneous with that first welcome sensation of anesthetic coursing through one's veins. Uh, by the 1990s, busy working women were being told to slow down, smell the roses. A Newsweek ran a cover story that was headlined uh, uh, Mommy Madness. And it reflected the, increasingly, the kind of increasingly ubiquitous advice of don't, uh, let, don't, don't do birth the hard way, do it the easy way. Uh, the author of the Mommy Madness article reported that 70% of mothers were finding motherhood incredibly stressful and she asked, why do so many of us feel so out of control? So the central question 
in the 1990s, shaping childbirth practices became, why would you want to add labor, another exhausting activity to a crushingly busy life, when you can watch television, you can converse, you can even nap as your cervix dilects if you get an epidural? Um, as one woman scolded in, a, in a, a magazine article, in a world where women are constantly proving their worth in the office, on the playing field, at home, unmedicated childbirth doesn't have to be singled out as proof of one's strength. And physicians echoed women's views. Uh, many expressed patient, um, impatience, really almost outright revulsion for any woman who wanted to forego the anesthesia or, or uh, epidural, I'm sorry, epidural, which is, that's regional anesthesia, um, or uh, expressed an interest in uh, natural childbirth. In a July 2006 Boston Globe magazine cover story, this was one of my favorite quotes ever. Uh, an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts, he likened any woman who would eagerly anticipate natural childbirth with a suicide bomber. He wrote, this is his quote, it's an interesting secular variation on a religious narrative where unbearable pain suddenly transmutes to boundless joy. Just as men blowing themselves to bits with suicide bombs think they will immediately appear in a paradise of virgins. In this atmosphere, newspapers and magazine articles began to portray epidurals as the ideal antidote to labor pain. As one woman explained about her decision to have an epidural during birth, she said, I wanted to make it as pleasant as possible for all concerned. I wanted to make it easy. So while some women had extolled natural childbirth because it allowed them to be in control, Today, women praise epidural anesthesia for the exact same reason. They say it, it allows them to maintain control. The definition of control, of course, has changed from one, uh, from one generation to another. Natural childbirth allowed women to be in control um, in the 1970s because it afforded them the opportunity they could then take charge of their labor and delivery. It wasn't the doctor running things. It wasn't the doctor drugging them. They were in control. Today. Epidural anesthesia allows laboring women to be in control because under its influence, women can relax, they can maintain their composure, and they can socialize normally. These two definitions of control reflect the contrasting identities and concerns of two back-to-back -back generations of American women. So as you can see, the social context and justification for obstetric anesthesia has changed often in the last 150 years. Yet the fundamental, sometimes incredibly bitter debate among physicians and women about the nature of labor pain and how to treat it hasn't. This debate throughout this 150 year period um, is represented by two general positions, which, which haven't changed. One side argues that birth is primarily a physiological event, and yes, it requires skilled and attentive medical presence, but largely they should have hands-off care. The other side argues that uh, birth is primarily a potentially pathological event that requires, again, a skilled and attentive presence, but largely hands-on medical care to avert the potential pathology. When it comes to obstetric anesthesia, these two sides are represented by two contemporary statements. One side argues, quote, there's no other circumstance where it's considered acceptable for a person to experience severe pain amenable to safe intervention while under a physician's care. And this is the side that argues that, that pain relief during labor is important. The other side observes obstetric anesthesia is unique in medicine in that we use an invasive and potentially hazardous procedure to provide a human humanitarian service to healthy women undergoing a physiological process. So even though the rationale for the use of obstetric anesthesia changes as women's roles in society change and as societal concerns change, the same fundamental debate has been threaded out, uh, threaded throughout this history with the popularity of one argument waxing as the other argument wanes. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. So please, I'm happy to answer any question. And just come up to the mic if you have a question. Yeah, if, please, anybody want to uh, offer a question for the, from the audience? 
And I should say, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit um, up on the third floor, you must see it. It's just outstanding. Hi, thank you for the talk. I learned a lot. Um, <laughs> but I have actually two questions. Uh, one being, uh, like, what trends are you noticing today? Um, and the other, I'm just kind of curious what your take on this whole like, subject is, given what you know. In fact, thank you for that question. In fact, my, the, the book I'm working on right now is a social history of cesarean section. And the two trends today, the two salient characteristics of childbirth today, well, actually three, are, yes, high epidural use. That, ha that hasn't ebbed. But also a very high induction rate of labor and a very high cesarean section rate. And the induction rate, I would say, the, the same source of high epidural use is, is also driving the, the induction rate. Um, because women are mainly working now, and they need to plan uh, everything. They need to plan if their, parent, if their parents can be in town when the baby's born. They need, they need to plan for um, when they have work off and what projects they need to finish up at work and who's going to do their work while they're gone. Um, they need to plan ahead, so they need to know the day they're going to go into labor. So many women are opt opting for um, labor induction, which um, traditionally has led to all kinds of problems. It can, it can lead to um, uh, medically caused prematurity of babies. Now, I mean, it got so serious that now the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists even says, don't induce before 39 weeks. Before it was thought, oh, 37 weeks is OK, 38 weeks is OK. So you have the high induction rate. And you also have the high cesarean rate, which is now one in three women now give birth by major abdominal surgery, which is a whole other story. Um, and again, it's going to be a book-like treatment, that, which is what I'm working on. But if you look at obstetrics logs, and I've looked at thousands of them now, whether it's the 1850s or the 1950s, doctors say consistently over time about 5% of births run into trouble and need medical intervention, 5%. Um, so there is no way that in our modern era with better nutrition, prenatal care, that 33% of women would need major surgery as an intervention. So there's a whole lot more going on there than medical need. And as you can see from the story about obstetric anesthesia, a lot goes into play. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, you mentioned that all of these trends reflect things that are going on politically. And I wonder if you could comment on what you've been able to notice in recent decades about what trends in these practices, how, how that reflects on political realities. Um, and, and if you could simultaneously comment about um, whether you noticed any race and class trends in different practices in recent decades. Um, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and, and I can talk a little bit about my current research um, in terms of cesarean section. Um, the very first, um, I would almost say guinea pigs of, of cesarean section, if, there was a, um, a medical statistician in the 1870s. The reason we know a little bit about cesarean section from the 19th century is because he um, was fascinated by cesarean section and took, up, took it upon himself to collect as much data as possible. And his papers are at the University of Minnesota. He was able to collect um, 85 different stories of, of cesarean birth, only 35 of which were published. Um, and his data shows that the bulk of cesarean sections in the 19th century were, were performed on black women, and most of them were slaves. And in that era, all the focus during childbirth was on saving the mother as opposed to saving the baby. Cesarean section really is about, um, at least theoretically speaking, about rescuing a baby from who knows what kind of danger, a theoretical, whether it's the heartbeat or, but in that era, um, clearly, it was, it was slave women who were operated on because perhaps, and conjecture, conjecture is, perhaps the mother was sick and the baby was more valuable to the slave owner than the mother was. Um, so you certainly see, you see race, you see class um, throughout a lot, of the, a, lot of that, uh, a lot of that history, step by step. Um, today, it's not that clear. 
because you don't, you don't, th there isn't data that's, a, that's that clearly available. Um, so I, 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 I can speak of, it's, it's harder to talk about now. Um, also, the records we have from hospitals, and again, 19th century hospitals, it was all um, working class women, all impoverished women, all homeless women. Um, so most of our medical records, even from the 19th century, rather than being about women who gave birth at home, the best records we have are actually of working class women. Um, unfortunately, though, it's hard to compare and contrast. We don't, we, we, um, we have the doctor's statistics um, and the doctor's words, we have fewer of the women's point of view and the women's words, so it's harder to, it's harder to glean. Well, let me suggest we continue these conversations upstairs, go up for the reception, and uh, thank you again for a wonderful talk. Thanks. Thank you.